Hello there, this is the final part of the Crusader States campaign, Abridged. Last time we sorted out the issue on our front lines fighting over a bridge, and then we had our last major decisive battle with the Moors where we just destroyed one of their armies and easily went on to take the rest of their territory, completing the campaign, and now we're here for one post-game episode to finish up a few items of business, and in particular, our boy, the Pope, currently has a crusade going to Lithuania, and we are going to go on it. This one fleet here that was supposed to be joining the crusade is being held back, and you can see I'm beginning to suspect that the agents on board are something to do with it, and I later realised that is, in fact, the reason. Having agents on a fleet means that their movement range gets interpreted as part of the fleet's movement range, and because they can't be on a crusade, they can't get the boost, Therefore, our crusade is going to be in two phases, with our two armies arriving one after the other. Anyway, while they're going, here's some interesting news. Quarezm, the big empire to our east that has basically conquered the Seljuks, has declared war on us all of a sudden. I only really recently found out about how much stuff they had because I got some map information off them a few turns ago, and you can see on the minimap they own everything to the right of us, except a tiny pocket of Seljuk resistance. And now they're just going right for us. They aren't satisfied with their recent conquests, so that's a shame. We do have a few units there at Edessa, the place that's under siege. But elsewhere, we don't really have anything, because I took all my units over to Iberia, of course, and now half of those guys have gone to Lithuania. I started recruiting some stuff. I've got loads of money now, so we can do this. Not that I really intend to fight this war. I mean, I already did a post-game war against Quarezm in my last campaign, playing Oriental Empire, so I'm not going to do it again. And actually, in the next turn, they abandoned the siege and walked off. And that was the end of that, as it turns out. They weren't that ambitious. They wanted to have a go, but I guess when they heard that I can now spam loads of knights across all my cities, they decided not to bother. So... The war didn't really come to anything, and we can go back to the more important business. We need to invade Lithuania, and our first army has now arrived. The question is where to dump it. There is a castle right there that I could take because it's super unguarded. However, I didn't want to take the time. I was desperate to be first to reach the crusade target, so we're going to go right for it. And as it happens, where I land here, there's a road that goes from the coast all the way to the crusade target, so we can just walk along it. There is, though, one enemy army standing on it. I decided to fight these guys. They've got a few interesting units, like the Lithuanian Noble Cav, who are basically knights. They're slightly weaker than knights in terms of their stats. Since I didn't want to lose many troops before getting to our final destination, I decided to do this one manually, even though it's an easy battle. Things started off with a skirmish. I've got my Javs fighting some Cantabrian circling Cav over there. And I'm trying to advance Cav on both wings, actually no, on my right wing. I initially went backwards. The thought there was I didn't want the enemy Cav to charge mine, because least of all I want my Cav to be damaged in this fight. I'm willing to sacrifice less useful infantry to keep my heavy Cav uh, for later battles that are more important. So indeed my Cav just kind of hide for a bit and then advance on the right. On the left they advanced but with skirmish mode off despite being skirmish Cav so that didn't go very well and I have to manually escape the enemy's cavalry attacks. So yes our front line just eats the enemy charge and starts getting killed as you might imagine and now my Cav will maneuver into position. The enemy's charge wasn't so heavy that we've been obliterated or something so we are locking them down ready for some good old hammer and anvil. On our left flank though the enemy didn't attack quite so fully, so we're going to have more room to manoeuvre here. I can even send some of the guys to go over and help with the cav fight, which we can't really see now going on in the woods, to make sure we win that. And very soon the enemy army starts just falling back and being destroyed, especially after I charged my king with a bunch of cav right down the centre to just take out enemy infantry. They don't have a general in this army, their morale is low, and there we go, there's the chain route. We carry on to get the magic number and eventually get the enemy army out of the way. We lost 300 men, and the question is, would I have actually lost more if I just auto-resolved that? I don't know. But whatever the case, we can now carry on and using our big crusade movement buff, actually get most of the way, trying not to be distracted by that tiny, tiny enemy army that was on the road that I could have fought. But no, there's no point, there's no point taking any losses before we get there, that's the thinking now. So again, the road's blocked in front of me, I could just attack them. But no, we are going to fortify and just sit here. That'll annoy the enemy if they want to attack me, and if they get out the way, then we'll be good for next turn with the second army that's gradually on the way. 
I wanted to experiment with this agent thing, so I just dumped them all off in France. And indeed, that gives me the magic movement again, so that's how I discovered the thing I mentioned earlier about agents not working with crusading armies. So then, now we can more rapidly show up with reinforcements, and the agents can just have a fun time looking around here. Looks like France and England are up to their old antics, no doubt, but that's of no interest to us. It looks like we were just in time arriving to the battlefront, because in the next turn, two other crusading armies have shown up here. Even the Pope himself seems to be taking part in this campaign, so good for him following up on his own crusade request. Now I thought here we had an opportunity, because as usual I was playing the game with my eyes 80% closed or something, and I thought this army outside the castle was a Lithuanian one, so I could attack it to do a siege draw out, but no, it's Hungarian and they just have a roughly, roughly similar colour to the Lithuanians. So eventually I realise what's going on and quickly dive in here to make the siege. Now we're the ones leading the attack. So it's definitely going to be us who ends up winning the crusade, getting the glory and indeed getting the territory. With the Quaresmians, I decided to ask for a ceasefire, asking for a bit of money as well, because apparently they really wanted this ceasefire. I think they bit off more than they could chew and probably don't know that all of my troops are elsewhere and they probably could invade me right now. So anyway, that war comes to an end with nothing happening, and in the next turn I even went to try and get an alliance so we could just ignore the whole front completely, but they come back to me with an interesting counteroffer. They say, no, we demand an alliance, and if we turn it down they'll attack us. But yes, I came here originally to ask for an alliance, so... Fine, it seems like I got what I wanted, even though they were doing some hostile negotiations. Perhaps they felt good about themselves there. And that interestingly ends the war between the Quaresmians and the Seljuks. So the Seljuks, who've been very good to me for the whole game, have finally got something out of their whole alliance with me. I'm going to reward them for not invading me when they easily could have, by getting them out of this war for a bit. Maybe they'll appreciate that in some way. Now, our second army is just arriving to the battlefront, and I figured they're probably not going to arrive to support the first army in time before we make the assault, so I thought, let's actually go after that random castle we throw on the way. Since we are forced to be at war with Lithuania because of the whole crusade, might as well start taking their territory, just to make our little foothold here in the northern part of the map a bit more substantial. In the next turn, it turns out that peace deal didn't last very long. The Quaresmians are now attacking the Seljuks again, and that cancels my alliance to Quaresm because I'm trying to keep mine with the Seljuks. So yes, things have broken down a bit, but still no war over there. Annoyingly, the Pope has gone away. I thought the Pope might uh, help us out with this attack up at Vilnius, but he's gone. And in fact, even the other Crusader armies hanging around can't help. And I suppose that's because we're not allied to them. Even though we're both on the same crusade, we can't fight together unless we're formal allies. So, this means this castle assault isn't the easy auto-resolve I thought it might just be there, but we will come back to that in a second. On the topic of auto-resolves, I decided to go over to that other castle siege and just auto-resolve that. It's not really an auto-resolvable situation, but doing this battle is just unimportant at this point. So, we hit the auto-resolve, I lose like half of my men, but we do take the castle, and that's that. Now we have a pointless foothold in Lithuania, adding to the Crusader States' power. There is another settlement we can take, in fact there are three more going up the northern coast that belong to Lithuania. So even after this crusade, there would be some uh, room for expansion for the Crusader States to make its own little kingdom up here as well, to match our two kingdoms in the bottom right and bottom left of the maps, gradually creating a big triangle of crusaderness, a triangle of Christianity across the entire European and North African continent. Out of interest, I was checking the distance to the capital thing, and this area is less far to the capital than Iberia, so having Lithuania will be easier on us than having southern Spain. Anyway, all that aside, this is going to be the final battle of the campaign. We're going to try and break into this castle. Unfortunately for us, the Lithuanians do have some decent units. They're all in the mid to good range. There's nothing trash like spear militia or anything which would have helped us out a lot. And of course, all our knights won't be very helpful. So, actually the advantage we have on the balance bar isn't all that significant going into this. 
Since I had the place under siege for two turns, I do have enough pieces of equipment to attack in loads of places at once, and therefore pick and choose where we're going to make our initial assaults, making sure to attack places that aren't very defended. And once that gets going, the AI starts walking about and we can get more attacks going as bits of wall become free, like up there on the northern wall. And we do get a tiny bit of a foothold on the southeastern part of the wall before the enemy reacts to us and attack. Pretty sure that gives us no particular advantage, but it does mean the towers weren't shooting us while I was setting up the ladders there, so we're a bit stronger than we would otherwise be. And again, there are more bits of the wall we can now successfully attack. Even parts where there are troops still, you can tell they're shuffling about and are probably going to run off, so I'm thinking, well, let's just get the attack going now. It'll be fine by the time we get there, I hope. Here at the northeastern wall, I did another attack where the enemy are contesting it, and this one's a bit more bloody because the guys defending the Ducal Axe infantry are good, as it turns out, and this unit, well, I don't know what its stats are, it's a mercenary spear unit, but it turns out they don't do very well against Ducal Axe infantry and they start getting mauled very badly. I've got reinforcements on the way, but I've timed that attack poorly. They're not going to arrive just as the fight starts, which would be ideal. I was trying to hurry along and get another fight going on in the south, but I was drawn back to this one by the flashing numbers and uh, just admiring how quickly we're dying. But yes, we have two units coming from either side to help. And once they arrive, things get a bit better. We've got Macemen and some Templar Knights, dismounted knights, who I think are better units. So while that spear unit is pretty much dead and is going to be killed completely, the attacks from the outside of the formation will now sort out those Ducal infantry and will be able to win that fight, eventually at least. The issue is that the enemy do have more troops on the wall, and interestingly enough, they brought a unit from roughly where the gatehouse is over to rear attack my Templar Knights. This had a really surprising effect in that it killed them. I figured this unit of Baltic Spears would be exactly the sort of thing the Templar Knights could deal with, but their initial group of 70 or so gets cut down to size real fast. For some reason, we're just being wiped out by the Baltic Spears. Might be some good old glitching going on with the units colliding in strange ways. Who knows? The other fights are a bit messy because my javelin men are in amongst the melee there. I'm going to try and get them out and get them down so they can throw up at the enemy later. And while all that's been going on, I have captured the southern gate. So now, for what it's worth, I can deploy some cav into the town and potentially get up to no good with them. So we've taken out those Ducal Axe infantry, but now everything in the northeast is trying to focus down that one unit of Baltic Spears that's killing everybody. At the same time, the enemy have a unit of Axemen going back into their second layer of defences, and there is a second layer by the way because this is an advanced castle. That means we theoretically have to besiege this inner castle as well and bring the siege equipment in. But because I caught these guys going through the gate just as my cav were arriving, I was able to engage them in melee while the gate was still open for them. They turned back to fighters and now we have the chance to gradually hack through them and shuffle through the gateway to capture it without having to find a ram and ladders and bring them up or anything like that. And this, broadly speaking, seems to work. These axemen might be good, but they're not good enough to resist the pushing charge of all these cav. This might be a case similar to what we saw previously where cav just walking forwards can kill units. Someone mentioned it's some kind of unpatched glitch that if you just walk through an enemy unit they just die automatically. Not sure if that's what's happening here, I think we are fighting them somewhat legitimately, but yes, the point is we're killing them, and the nearby enemy troops are ignoring us, which is really helpful. But for one unit, which was up on the walls and came down to help, so after we killed the first axe unit, we ended up fighting another identical axe unit. We've still got some reserves that aren't being used, so I'm going to move them up towards the inner castle to help out with the fight over there. But we don't really need that help, because we have successfully captured the gate, and our troops inside are, as I said, just being ignored by the enemy. Most of their heavy cav nearby are content to sit on the capture point. With that, well, I'm content to just sit near them and wait, because we've got more troops on the way, might as well wait for them to show up. Meanwhile, I did want to try and resolve this fighting on the outer wall. I tried bringing up my Jav Cav to throw into the flanks of these Baltic Spears. We've got a few kills like this, but the problem with this strategy is that those Jav Cav actually have very little ammunition, four or five throws. So already they're out, they only just started and that attack is now over. But I can instead bring over the Kurdish Javs, the survivors of them, to try the same thing. It took a long time to get some guys actually throwing, and even then we couldn't get everybody to throw. But eventually we put some Javs onto those guys, and that's going to help us kill them a little bit. But really this is happening so slowly that 
we're more killing them with sheer attrition, with them fighting our own spears and both sides just getting killed in a slaughterous battle. Eventually, we do manage to rout that one unit. The nearby troops can chase them so they don't get back to the second layer of defences, and other troops will rear attack another holdout unit nearby. With all that, the outer part of the battle is finally over. As for the inner part, well, during the delay, I moved up my ranged units to sit on the enemy's inner walls. Then they can gradually and creepily turn round like these crossbows and shoot into the enemy's heavy cav. The first volley gets us like 20 kills against their noble cav, that's great, but it does activate the AI, they realise they're in trouble here, so they charge out. This isn't so bad though, because all they can do is charge a really short distance into our own cav who are waiting around. They're still going to be in range of all our stuff on the wall. So even if the cav battle is unwinnable, and it might actually be winnable, I'm not sure, we can rely on the fact that arrows and bolts and even javelins will probably be hitting the enemy more than they're hitting us. Plus, I've got two more units of cav just outside the gate that weren't doing anything, so I can bring them in to help, including our king. Our king in particular actually loses tons of men, I'm not quite sure how, but I tried to just run past the melee and he somehow lost like 20 guys in the process, but doesn't really matter. We turn around and take them down. There's only a few guys left. I think they've got a general unit with just one guy in it who's around there somewhere. I'm struggling to click on him. There he is. We've got this at this stage, so a little grind later finishes off everything, and we win the battle. So like that, the Crusade has been successful, with all of our gloriously colourful Crusader Knights there to celebrate it. A clear victory and a nice messy victory as well, with massive casualties, and a few units that are totally destroyed, but again, doesn't matter. I'm even going to let some of the local civilians live, because I'm so kind, wouldn't want the Crusades to get a bad reputation of course. The Pope is very happy with our performance, and there is the message saying we've completed the Crusade. We get some money, doesn't really matter. The point is, it's a propaganda victory. The Crusader states have crusaded successfully once again, and created our third corner in the Triangle of Catholicism. With room to expand too, there are more heathens and pagans around for us to deal with. So I'm sure our lovely crusaders will have much more fun with that going into the future, but we won't be there to see it because this is going to be the end of this campaign. I played a couple more turns, and the most interesting thing that happened was actually in the next turn. The Pope died. That's a shame, he wasn't even that old, and he was our Pope as well. But then the good news is we've got the College of Cardinals totally stacked with their own guys. So boom, we immediately get a new Pope who's also of the Crusade Estates, and that also doesn't do anything, but it feels good. And then our King dies. So it seems like a bad omen that the Pope and the King of the Crusader States suddenly died after doing a crusade. Could this be a sign? I like to interpret it as God prematurely killing the leaders of the crusade in order to get them to heaven faster as a reward. That's one way of spinning it. Our new king really sucks. It's this guy over here in the other Lithuanian castle. He's got one authority, so I'm pretty sure if we moved any units out of these castles they would just immediately rebel. That would hold us back if we had to keep playing. Luckily, we don't have to keep playing because I've decided not to, so we get away with that. Now, back down in the Holy Land, the heretic problem was gradually coming back at about this point, and that was just because all of the cardinals we have, and now over in Iberia, the ones we used to have, all died of old age, and I recruited new ones in Iberia. So, I'm back to trying to take this guy down with an assassin, and here was my attempt just for fun. Doesn't go very well, he immediately dies, and that's the end of that. What you expect from an assassin, really? So, we do need to get some more cardinals to sort that out, but shipping them over here will probably take a while. So I expect that hereticism and whatever religion they're trying to spread is going to be dominating the Holy Land for a bit until the Catholics get back in and take over, but I'm sure they would be able to sort that out. Now let's look at the scores. No idea how the scores are calculated, but just for fun, let's see what they are. Looks like us, the Byzantines, and the Quaresmians are the top three factions by a wide margin, and we're all about equal as well, we're in joint first place. The Byzantines were always in first place, and have always been, so they seem to be a good faction, but we've shot up, as have the Quaresmians. We're going to look through the other things other than overall ranking in top five mode to see who is dominating the planet right now. Military ranking looks like the Byzantines are well on top, we're winning for production, don't really know what that is, but it sounds like a good thing. Territorial, we're winning there as well, we do actually have the biggest faction as was mentioned previously. We're also pretty rich by the looks of things, we've shot up in the financial rankings, yes we have tons of money and we could get more, everything's on low tax rate right now. 
And at the end there, we do also have the largest population to go on top of our largest territory. So overall, Crusader States, best states, I think. The last thing we're going to do for this series is take a look at the world map. Someone reminded me to do this just in time to make it into the video. So I've turned the fog of war off. Let's see what's going on around the world right now. In the top right, it's the Rus factions and the Kumans just doing their thing. It's all less impressive than it looks because the territories are all huge. So they're not very big factions, they just look very big. The Middle East is of course going to be dominated by the Khwarezmians who've taken down the Seljuks and us sitting over here. Then there's Africa, which is mostly dominated by the Sicilian Empire, the new Roman Empire of our age. I described it as the Carthaginian Empire earlier. But we can see here they actually do control not only Sicily, but southern Italy as well. So perhaps they are eking their way up to taking down the Papal States and reforming the Roman Empire. They're clearly thinking about it. Elsewhere in Italy, Genoa is doing particularly well. They've taken loads of territories all over the place. And uh, some of their gains have been against the Holy Roman Empire, which is just in trouble there. There's huge border gore going on. Looks like France is slowly falling to the Genoese as well. And yes, you can see there's a whole mix of territories between Poland, the Imperials, and various other factions we've got in here, including the English, who have even got a bit of a foothold up on the coast. The Danish are in there as well. The Danish have uh, been quite successful by the looks of things because they've got not only Denmark, but a whole bunch of Sweden as well. Maybe they started with it, I don't know. At some point, they'll have to take down Norway to truly secure their area, but not much appears to be going on around there. Then there is France, where it's all a big mess. I think France is at war with the Holy Roman Empire, and they've been trading some territory. They've probably had trouble with England as well, I expect. But the real trouble has been with the Aragonese, who have conquered up and have started taking over France by the looks of things. So France is now being gradually taken down by yellow-coloured factions in the Aragonese and the Genoese. Over to the east in the Balkans, we can see the Byzantines are dominating everything as you might expect. The Hungarians are there too, with a sizable kingdom. The Cumans have a random bit of territory there as well. But yes, the Byzantines, for being potentially the number one faction, don't look that impressive. They don't have that much territory. Perhaps it's more than it seems, because they do have this big strip going around the Black Sea as well, and some stuff up at the Crimea. So I guess they're pretty rich or something, and it's going well. As for their rival, the Seljuks, it's going very poorly for them. They've been really taken down by the ascendants of Khwarezm, and it looks like the Byzantines are about to start conquering Anatolia as well, and the Seljuks probably won't last very long in this game. And we're back to the Holy Land. So this is us. We've done it, guys. We've crusaded very, very successfully. Not only did we secure the Holy Land, but we've randomly secured a bunch of stuff from other factions. And no, we're not going to give it back. This crusade is really just for us at this point. So I think that's gone pretty well. Anyway, that is the end of this campaign. Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end. The next abridged campaign I think is going to be XCOM 2 with the Long War mod. I'm picking things that did very well in a recent vote. And that and Stellaris were the two things that are probably the best contenders for the next series. But I don't know how to play Stellaris, so I was planning on working that out and in the meantime playing some XCOM 2, probably modding it so that the Long War isn't that long, otherwise the series will go on forever. We'll see, I hope you'll join me for that, and even if you don't, thank you very much for joining me for this.